This recording will go over IV solutions, blood transfusions, and fluid balance. The three general classifications of IV solutions used for fluid replacements are crystalloids, colloids, and blood and blood products. Crystalloid solutions contain fluids and electrolytes and are able to freely cross capillary walls. They do not contain any proteins. Crystalloids are used as short-term maintenance fluids and to treat dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. The three major classification of crystalloid IV fluids are isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. So let's take a look at these different types of crystalloid solutions. So isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. When you see iso, ISO, you should be thinking same. Hypo, you should recognize as meaning low, and hyper, meaning high. So when we're talking about isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic, what are, we, what are we talking about? What's the same? What's low? What's high? We're talking about the solutes within the solution. So when I say solutes, we're talking about those dissolved particles that are in the IV solution. So let's think about normal saline. Normal saline is a very common IV solution that you see in the clinical setting. Um, it's also known as or labeled 0.9% sodium chloride. So that is an isotonic solution meaning that those sodium particles that are in that fluid are equal or the same, the same sort of osmolality as that of your plasma, right? So as a result, with isotonic solutions, such as normal saline, um, the solution itself has equal, solute, equal water to, the, to what the plasma already has, so there's no movement of water into or out of cells. So your red blood cells um, remain their same sh uh, shape and size. So isotonic solutions have the same approximate osmolality as extracellular fluid or plasma. Because of the osmotic equilibrium, water does not enter or leave the cell. Therefore, there is no effect on red blood cells. Hypotonic solutions, so let's look at that one again. Hypo meaning lower, so they have less solutes um, in the solution than what's in the plasma, right? So that means if I have a hypotonic solution, it has a higher concentration of water than the plasma does. So what happens is that water moves into the cell to try to balance things out, causing the cell to swell. And it can also cause lysis, causing the cell to actually rupture. Hypotonic solutions exert less osmotic pressure than extracellular fluid, which allows water to move into the cell. Then finally, we have hypertonic solutions. Hyper meaning high, right? So these solutions have a high concentration of solutes. And what happens is water leaves the cells to try to balance out, you know, what we're putting in versus what the body has. So with those hypertonic solutions, water will leave the cell. So with those hypertonic solutions, water will leave the cell, causing the cell to shrink. So if you look at table 12.4 in your textbook on page 159, it has a list of the different types of IV solutions. You need to recognize an IV solution as being isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic. And so you're looking there and it's a decent sized list, but what you really need to do, so here's your study tip to memorize what's what, is you need to memorize what's isotonic. Once you have down which fluids are isotonic, then you can deduce, because you know what's isotonic, whether a different solution is hypotonic or hypertonic. So let's take a look at that. So isotonic, you have four things you have to memorize with these IV fluids. Lactated ringers, ringer solution, normal sal saline, which is the 0.9% sodium chloride, I'm missing an L there, right? And 5% dextrose in water. So those four solutions you need to memorize as being isotonic. And then, so just a little quiz, right? So with isotonic solutions, does water move in or out of the cells? That's a no, right? Isotonic is the same osmolality as the plasma. There's no movement of water. So before we talk about the different um, types of solutions between isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic, let's look at these specific isotonic solutions. So normal saline, or 0.9% sodium chloride is going to be the most common um, IV solution that you're going to see on the med surge floor. And what it is, is 
Um, basically, sodium chloride dissolved in water. So normal saline is a sodium chloride solution. Normal saline is primary, primarily used for hydration to expand the extracellular fluid volume and also during blood product transfusions. Balanced electrolyte solutions, such as lactated ringer solutions and ringer solution, contains electrolytes, no magnesium, and minimal calories with the addition of dextrose. Their primary use is hydration and electrolyte replacement. Dextrose with that OSE is a simple sugar like glucose. Dextrose solutions provide hydration and some calories and increase glucose levels in the blood. So let's compare isotonic to hypotonic. So with isotonic, I told you those are the ones that you need to memorize. So isotonic, the sodium solution is 0.9% sodium chloride. If you look at the hypotonic, all these are less than 0.9%, right? So they're all um, classifications of sodium chloride. Um, not classifications, but concentrations of sodium chloride. And these hypotonic have a lower uh, concentration of those solutes than what our normal serum values are. So again, 0 0.9, and remember this is a decimal, right? So don't say, well, 45 is higher than 9 and get confused with that. So 0 0.9, um, 0 0.45, 0 0.33, 0 0.225 are all less than 0 0.9. So we can easily deduce that these, these are hypotonic solutions right, that have a lower solute concentration than normal saline, which is isotonic. In terms of isotonic versus hypertonic, right, a hypertonic solution with sodium chloride is 3%. I have memorized that my isotonic sodium chloride solution is 0.9%, so obviously this whole number of 3% sodium chloride is a hypertonic solution. In regards to the dextrose solutions, we know that our isotonic solution is 5% dextrose in water. So if I have 5% dextrose <clears throat> com combined with anything other than water, that's going to make it hypertonic because these other combinations, we're adding things with solutes, right? So more solutes making it hypertonic. Isotonic, 5% dextrose in water. Hypertonic, 5% dextrose with anything other than water half normal saline or 0.5 percent um, sodium chloride 5 percent dextrose and normal saline also known as 0.9 percent sodium chloride or 5 percent dextrose and lactated ringers so you know the 5 percent dextrose in water is isotonic so anything higher than um, 5 percent dextrose in water would be considered hypertonic so 10 percent or even 50 percent dextrose in water would be considered a hypertonic solution It's worth mentioning that dextrose can be irritating to veins as a result of the pH of the solution. If hypertonic solutions are not diluted and are given peripherally, there is a risk for vein irritation, damage, and thrombosis. Colloid solutions contain protein or other large molecular substances that increase osmolarity without dissolving in the solution. Because of their size, the particles are unable to pass through the semi-permeable membranes of the capillary walls and stay within the intravascular compartment. Thus, colloids are also known as plasma expanders. They're known as plasma expanders because those protein and large, po um, large particles that are stuck within the blood vessel, right, help to pull water into the blood vessels. So pull water from the interstitial space into the plasma to increase blood volume. The composition of colloid solutions include proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. And the three types of colloid solutions you need to be familiar with are dextran solutions, HETA starch, and albumin. And albumin you should recognize as a protein solution. Blood products include packed red blood cells, plasma, and platelets, as well as whole blood. 
A unit of packed red blood cells contains concentrated red blood cells with most of the plasma and platelets removed. The approximate value, value of a unit of packed red blood cells is 350 milliliters per unit. Things you need to know about packed red blood cell transfusions is that the IV should be a 19 gauge or larger. Um, I have seen in practice that sometimes we'll use um, smaller gauge IV cannulas when we have to, but ideally the larger the better when we're talking about a blood transfusion. Uh, we want to use special filter tubing with uh, blood transfusions. The max time from the time that you get your unit of blood is four hours. You have four hours to infuse that, that blood. And if the four hour mark hits and you haven't infused it all, you have to return what's left back um, to the lab, right? So you have to get it in in four hours. And after four hours, if there's any left, you can't give it. Uh, the most, pop, most facilities also have policies about how long you can, when you go to the lab and grab the blood, how long you can wait before you actually start infusing it. So when you give a blood transfusion, you wanna make sure that you're ready to start it when you go to get it. Another important thing is that we never add medications to packed red blood cells when we're giving those. I'll add in here also, um, always with um, normal saline. So the IV fluids that we combine with the blood transfusion are always, always, always normal saline or 0.9% sodium chloride. No other solution will we use with our blood transfusions. And if we look at our Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goals regarding blood transfusions, there's a couple of things. We want to match the blood and blood component to the order. So there's a lot of verification when given a blood transfusion. Match the patient to the blood or blood product and use a two-person verification process or a one-person verification process accompanied by automated identification technology such as barcoding. So some facilities require a second RN to verify blood products with you before you administer. Other facilities allow you to use a computer scanner to act as your second verification. A lipid emulsion is a fat emulsion. It's a component of parenteral nutrition for patients who are unable to get nutrition through an oral diet. Fat emulsion can supply up to 30% of the patient's caloric intake and is usually recommended for patients who are unable to tolerate oral or enteral feedings for seven days or more. So I want you to review the nursing process box regarding fluid imbalance that starts on page 161 on your own. And when you're reviewing it, what I want you to focus on are the signs and symptoms of fluid volume deficit and fluid volume excess, right? We're given these IV fluids to treat dehydration. So what do I see in my patient who's dehydrated? What if I've given them too much IV fluid? What am I looking for to see fluid volume excess or overload? Also, what's the best way to measure my patients or monitor my patients um, fluid status, right? They come in um, with fluid overload. How do I know that that fluid's coming off of them? And it's by weight, right? Those daily weights. So it's very, very important that you know that daily weights is the, is the best way to monitor fluid in the patient. And you need to know that one liter of fluent, fluid is equivalent to one kilogram of weight, right? And so that's how we monitor uh, fluid in their patient. So again, that nursing process box, I'm gonna let you look at on your own. I want you to know weight, know the one liter to one kilogram and why that's important. And I want you to know the signs and symptoms of too much fluid, uh, fluid volume excess or overload, and too little fluid, fluid volume deficit or dehydration.